Welcome to the Leadership Exposé podcast. This podcast is for purpose-driven leaders at diverse levels and organizations around the world who are seeking to scale and transform their leadership, to level up their business, and to create an impact in the lives of people all around them. Business and boardroom topics, trends, innovation, transformation, and the intersection with leadership is the focus. We enable success. I'm your host, Stephen Paul. In this episode, we meet Jeremy Januski, is the CEO of uh, Travel Radar, an air travel organization. Jeremy has several roles, including that of a keynote speaker, um, aircraft cabin designer, university board member, aviation consultant, and so many things that he does outside of work. We'll hear about Jeremy's journey, his connection with aviation and the seamless experience he brings to people around the world through all the things that, that he does professionally and personally. Welcome, Jeremy. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful. Jeremy, you know, just before we started this podcast, we exchanged where we're located. Um, mm -hmm. I'm here in London, UK. What about you? Uh, I'm here in uh, Orlando, Florida. It's hot, steamy. <laughs> Uh, it's just about the closest thing you can get to uh, to hell on earth, but it's fun. <laughs> well, we're approaching winter very shortly, so uh, it should start cooling down a little bit, right? Yeah, um, I think we got about three more months. It doesn't really start cooling down here until, gosh, at least mid-November. Yeah. Uh, December, give or take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here in the UK um yeah we're getting we're, we're already getting a feel for for winter i mean it's it's still the start of the fall but uh but yeah it's 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 already getting into the uh, uh 10 degrees celsius in the evening <laughs> type of temperatures uh that sounds like so much fun to be yeah. honest with you i would i would give anything to have that here but uh i think i travel enough to get to experience yeah, uh, I guess what it would be autumn and winter in different places too. So that's good. Yeah, excellent. Jeremy, we're keen to hear about uh, your your journey. Um, tell us a little bit about your personal journey, your intersection with professional leadership, and um, and through that process, tell us one thing that nobody knows about you. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Where did uh, it all begin? <laughs> Gosh, you want me to give you a quick uh, summary of, I guess, from when I was born to... Yeah, you know, go for it. Your personal yeah. and your professional journey. Yeah, yeah, go okay. for it. Okay, yeah. My professional journey is really just my uh, personal journey. Um, so, uh, you know, I've never really had, like, uh, I guess, a real uh, corporate job or, you know, real uh, what would be, a, you know, just like a typical job or whatever. But anyways start from the beginning to gonna be crazy i guess this is something i've never really said uh you know publicly on a podcast before so that's gonna be a little weird um but i was born on a college campus i was uh i was adopted and the people that i was adopted from um she was a college student um and she had me on the college campus uh she was i don't know how to say this politely i can't say knocked up that's way <laughs> inappropriate <laughs> but uh she became pregnant from a uh some other student who was uh visiting uh from another college um i guess to put it crudely i was a mistake <laughs> but uh <laughs> Um, but yeah, shortly after that, I was, uh, put into, uh, foster care and I was adopted by, uh, my family now, which is the best family, um, anyone could have. And I, I do sincerely mean that, uh, I know everyone says that, but no, it, it's the truth. It's 100% the truth. Um, so that's, that was kind of a rough start to life, I guess. Um, but at least interesting, um, and then I had a uh, pretty normal uh, childhood up until about age two, two and a half. Um, everything was developing just just fine um, until that age. And then 
just about all of a sudden, uh, my speech dropped off and I began to uh, almost become distant and uh, kind of withdraw. And from that age onward, uh, I was uh, diagnosed with autism. I had a more severe uh, form of uh, autism. At that time, they had a diagnosis. I think it's still um, used in uh, the UK and most of the world. It's called Asperger's syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, here, we don't use it anymore for some reason. I have no idea why. Um, it's just autism here. But when I was two and a half, it was it was more severe than, uh, I guess, just Asperger's. Um, and I wasn't really, I guess, supposed to have any uh, future whatsoever. Um, so I guess that was, uh, that was pretty difficult. I do remember those times. I remember listening to people and it just didn't quite make any sense. It was like people were speaking too fast at a normal pace. They would speak at a normal pace, however, too fast. And it just didn't sound like anything, uh, that was real almost like gibberish if yeah. that makes any sense yeah and yeah. i didn't really start speaking until i was about five um and mm -hmm. i didn't read until i was about nine maybe ten um which was pretty difficult um but ever since i can remember i always it's not quite just a passion it's um it's like a like a built-in mission or built-in like direction in me yeah it's almost instinctual in terms of uh, always wanting to be in air travel specifically airline business and uh i guess i've just kind of always known that since the beginning so that serves a huge purpose there because um i have the uh, some of the advantages of uh being autistic um and then now just, you know, to quickly interject, uh, through all of the earlier intervention um, and then the work, it, my mom has been the differential factor, um, I guess, that brought the uh, autism diagnosis a little less severe into uh, Asperger's. And then um, I don't mean to, you know, get too full of myself here, but uh, it's almost uh, un- recognizable as Asperger's now just in in daily life so I have a lot of awkward things that I do yeah um you know like the way I stand and uh, just very awkward personality <laughs> um <laughs> yeah like just these weird little interests and in, like random things that people find annoying yeah um that's still very apparent but um but that's that served as a uh probably the the greatest asset in pursuit mm -hmm. of basically everything that I've ever wanted. Mm -hmm. um, that and I think bullying and then social isolation um, are probably the two autism and then uh, being bullied in school and, you know, that, that social uh, what isolation. I mm -hmm. think those are the two best advantages anyone could have um, in terms of getting ahead. It's a price you wouldn't want to pay if you have the choice, but if you have to, then that's a good, yeah. I think, a good silver lining because you have all this time um, yeah. away from other people that you're just never going to be included um, in anything social. Yeah. Uh, and then that bullying just tends to, you know, distant you. Um, and I think you have about two options there. You tend to get two different results. You get people... Uh, like Steve Jobs or something mm -hmm. like that, then you get very, you know, or three results. You have, you know, geniuses like that. And then you have, you know, these mild uh, hyper-focus cases, uh, I guess, like mine, who just get lucky a lot. And then you have on the uh, far end, which is absolutely terrible, you have, you know, people who are bullied so much and then become you know, people like school shooters. It's just, it's such a broad spectrum. And I think it's a really dangerous thing to, for society uh, to kind of appreciate um, people who were bullied, um, yeah. even though they may be successful. It, you know, bullying is not, um, it's not a good thing to, to wish for. 
Mm -hmm. But it's important that, you know, we recognize, um, you know, across this very broad uh, scale or spectrum, no pun intended, um, that you have sometimes good results and, you know, other times there's very bad results. But I think it's one of the most beneficial things um, in terms of development of um, people who are good at their craft. Yeah, is yeah. Uh, bullying in their childhood, which is, I don't like saying it, but I, that's something I definitely believe deep down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as as you were just describing this, Jeremy. I mean, like, I'm I'm just thinking. Yes, of course, you've had, you know, a childhood, but also there are a lot of strengths that you have learned, adopted, and you're living with a lot of that as well. So. I view a lot of this, you know, as as you know, as as positive as well, because there's there's great and positive outcomes that has come out of all of this, and you're living it as well. I try to, um, I guess so, yeah. But um, you know, like I said, it's a good thing, but I I don't think anyone would want to go out of their way if they had the choice. If you could choose mm -hmm. right now, go left or go right, um, you know, right just continues along. Uh, a typical path, a more comfortable path, and then left is something so uh, so chaotic, I guess, as uh, as mine. Um, to put it crudely, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I guess there's something to be said for it. But I pro I probably am wrong on several aspects of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and then when I was about seven or eight years old, um, something. Something happened, and I developed uh, something called Tourette's syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was really just that was probably the darkest point um, in my entire life. That right there, and that went away within about a year and a half. Strangely, um, that's that was really. That was really challenging. That was a more formative experience that I definitely could have done without. But again, it was one of those things where you become so distant from the rest of the world that it you, you almost have nothing else to do but to focus on things that you, you know, like to do. In this case, it happens to be aviation, specifically uh, airline business. Um, then there was, you know, just like high school, just normal, mm -hmm. um, stuff. And that was pretty brutal in itself, but it wasn't too bad, I guess. Um, I had a great family life, but you know, anything outside of the house was just so, so damn difficult. I'll tell you that. Um, and in fact, it was actually so difficult, uh, that my mom, and my father decided to put me in uh, special education, a special education dedicated uh, school. Um, not so much because of the learning disabilities or, you know, whatever you would want to um, refer to it as, but because the bullying was so bad that it was, it was something uh, the extra support was obviously necessary. Um, but it was, a is, I guess, the only option to keep, uh, that sort of uh, that abuse or bullying away mm -hmm. um, is something, I guess, to protect me, which really sucked. But I guess it was important. But anyways, um, after after what high school, I went. I got accepted into a. Uh, I guess it was a pretty good college uh, here in town. It was called Rollins College. Um, I failed out of that kind of on purpose. I used to stay, uh, used to hang up my hammock um, right by the lake. There's a lake uh, that Rollins College is built upon. It's just north of uh, Orlando International Airport. So they have obviously just a great view, an open view. Mm. of uh, You can see probably about a mile out horizontally um, and then, you know, five miles, 10 miles, anything above 10 degrees, right? Um, so that was great. I just used to watch the airplanes and 
just not show up to class. Um, for some reason, I kind of knew inside that I wasn't in the right place. Um, well, obviously, by the lake was pretty much the right place yeah. for the airplanes, yeah. but um, but in a in a university like that, then I tend to notice that a lot of the people who went there have a bright future ahead of them, but it wasn't uh, necessarily something that they wanted to do. Um, and it was almost as if the students there went on to uh, you know, go and to get fantastic degrees and uh, have proven track records, um, obviously, because it's a great school in uh, disciplines like business, um, creative writing. Uh, a lot of, I guess, excuse me, um, influential people or whatever you would like to call it, went to uh, went to school there throughout the years. Uh, but it just wasn't wasn't for me. And it's a type of place where people narrow down uh, their dreams in exchange for, a, mm -hmm. you know, a great sort of income or what would be uh, considered a successful future. It's a safe bet at an expensive school for an OK mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I realized that not everyone that graduates from there is is happy. Uh, successful but not happy obviously there's some exceptions but that tended to be the majority of the alumni i would speak to mm -hmm. then after that i went to a uh, a state school and a uh, a different university in uh, just up the road about 120 miles up the road in jacksonville uh, mm -hmm. jacksonville florida um and i failed out of there too at the uh, one of the colleges, I was in a, a professional pilot uh, mm -hmm. program because I do like to fly as well. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, build my own airplanes and I fly them, which is, I guess, pretty fun. Um, but through that, I just it wasn't it wasn't my thing. And then, and then I kind of realized after dropping out of there or on the way to doing it, which sounds so terrible, and I wouldn't recommend it. But um, I think dropping out several times was probably the best decision. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uncomfortable. You're discovering yourself, right? In in a way. Um, I think it was just cutting out the uh, unnecessary. Um, it's like a time liability. Mm -hmm. The liability on uh, on time, um, and passion. But I didn't quite realize that it wasn't normal to have this much experience in aviation and then come to see that a lot of jobs and positions in aviation were quite simple. Um, and I just kind of got the, uh, got the sense that I could start some of my own, uh, mm -hmm. journeys at, you know, airlines, um, and different businesses in aviation, uh, even without a degree. And I figured that that would be less time consuming. It would be a quicker path and more efficient. Um, cause again, with the thing with universities is that in business, I tend to find that a lot of people, the higher the education, the more education you have in business, it tends to be, and now I'm probably wrong about this too, is that there's less creativity, uh, and mm -hmm. sincere curiosity within your craft, mm -hmm. the longer you stay in a business oriented school. After that, it tends to become a repetition of what hasn't worked before for other people and other companies in the past and more so a recitation of rules and regulations versus you know a sense of curiosity and experimentation um and you know you know through that there could be obviously some uh, uh expensive uh, uh difficulties you run into in terms of well you find out you can't do this because uh, it's against like you know, government regulations um, which you would never obviously want to to violate, but at least you have that experience of having ex uh, experimented mm -hmm. with um, different developments in business, different approaches to things, and then you obviously have that experience uh, taking a creative path um, and more of a critical thinking path. Yeah, um, which I think it's better, uh, you know, leading to happiness. But I think. Obviously, the thing about happiness is uh, you're mostly born with it mm. and you have to protect it, not gain it. Mm. And then obviously, when you protect it, it tends, tends to uh, tends to grow with how much time you spend during the day 
how much time, how many hours of your life, um, you know, the majority of them, I think, should be spent doing something you love or you're not going to retain um, who you are. And from that point on, I just couldn't get any jobs whatsoever in aviation. So I did feel like quite a failure for, I guess, the longest time. Um, but I did always keep on trying. That's for sure. Um, and then I was tired on. I, guess I'm, I helped start a uh, an aircraft, uh, an aviation brokerage here in uh, Orlando. Mm -hmm. And uh, through that, we uh, we help clients buy and sell uh, private jets, which is just the funnest thing in the entire world. Um, that and like my other job as well and several other things in aviation and outside of aviation too. Um, that one's really fun because you get to be just really nerdy about a very particular subject and mm -hmm. you're paid to learn about the most uh, boring, intricate things that aren't so boring to you. However, still quite intricate yeah um and i love the uh business development part and the economics of it um building a business is in aviation is you know just uh, 110 percent fun compared to the 100 percent of just working for a company in mm -hmm. aviation uh but the autonomy is great and i absolutely love that it's so much fun um and the money's pretty good too but uh, the money's important for developing a different business in the future. I also tend to find that money uh, is a liability um, mm -hmm. in terms of personal uh, corruption. So in my case, I feel as if uh, I'm 25, so I'm only I'm only mm -hmm. 25. I don't have very much experience in anything or knowledge or any sort of wisdom whatsoever. Um, but I tend to find that someone my age I don't think should have personal finances um, as ready and abundant um, as, you know, they may wish, because I don't think people my age tend to be emotionally uh, mature enough to handle um, finances uh, and that abundance and then also power as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a liability you put upon yourself. Um, I tend to believe you know, it's, it's anecdotal, um, but the money I I uh, want to use um, to eventually start my own airline, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps 25, 30 years from now or however long it takes, mm -hmm. uh, but that's going to require obviously a lot of capital, um, but hopefully I'll get there. Hopefully by that time, airlines won't be uh, exclusively flying in the space. Um, hopefully there'll still be some... Uh, airlines flying here uh, on the surface because I, you know, I need a new uh, category of aerospace. It's like I need a hole in the head. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I would be really interested in going to space, but uh, I, you know, I can't, I don't want to get into another, another uh, area of focus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's, I guess the, the main goal here and um, starting plenty of other businesses too. Uh, I guess for fun. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Uh, My brain's just kind uh, of exploding uh, right now. Absolutely, absolutely. I was just, I was just um, in, intentionally just listening to all the things that you were going through, pivoting through life, and uh, you mentioned about, uh, you know, your your interest of airline aviation. You you touched upon, you know, bro brokerage. Then you you touched upon different strands of business, as in starting a business, building a business, the economics of it, business development. So you you and and you mentioned a few things that you're doing outside of aviation as well. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, at the at your at your age, I mean, like even at my age, at twenty five, at you know, at the time. I was just thinking. I I just didn't even know what I was what I was trying to try to achieve in my life, and and no probably that's the case. Either. Yeah, and that's probably the case of many people. Uh, like you know, you, you know, in, in that in that age range as well, because you're you're trying out things and you're experimenting, 
and you're trying to find your feet on and your interest you're you're trying to build your vision and so forth and uh, you know just hearing intently with uh, with all the things that you're trying to formulate as well so um i, I heard quite a few things here there's there's aviation there is brokerage there is lots of things in parallel you mentioned about building your own airline um you know in the next couple of decades or so uh, if i'm lucky and i guess if you're lucky yeah but these are great visions tell us tell us what, what other things are on your mind what's what's your primary area of focus um one of my primary areas of focus uh what to getting to the phase where i can build an airline mm -hmm. yeah i think my number one focus is to not accidentally die doing something really stupid like driving a scooter off a cliff by accident that's kind of like the number one the mm. number one thing i can be a real uh adventurous idiot from time to time so i think the number one thing is try not to be an idiot um and i think i'm also clumsy enough to accidentally uh burn myself with the microwave from the inside out so like mm, definitely want to avoid being uh so clumsy um, and live to 35 years from now where I can start an airline. Yeah. But um, I guess in all seriousness, the uh, my number one focus, I guess it's just to do um, whatever tends to, to make me happy and continue uh, mm -hmm. uh, this preservation of um, curiosity um adventure I, I don't know what to call it but it's something instinctual um that i feel towards yeah this and you know i tend to just have to follow it where it takes me yeah and 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 through this journey and through the work that you're doing sure aviation or outside of aviation are there any things that you you've experienced that has resulted in a you know, highly positive outcome. Um, anything, any story that you want to share? Aside from what you, aside from the things that you touched on. <laughs> um, probably, I can't think of any. Uh... Okay. Are there are there people that you are there people that you follow or you know kind of uh, look up to or books that you read? No, I don't. Yeah, yeah. I barely read at all i hate reading i know yeah, um, yeah but i read when yeah. when necessary i think it's such an inefficient way to absorb information with the resources that i have available now i mean uh, yeah. living in this day and age i think reading actually can be almost a time liability unless it's absolutely necessary and whatever you're reading has yeah. uh the information that you that you need yeah. um I know that can be kind of controversial, but I find there's other Not ways really. of no. absorbing information quicker yeah. and more efficiently. Yeah, I think I think in 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 my view, I mean, like I do read, but I I use the audio versions because you know, like you said, time is precious, and there's lots of information out there on the web. Um, I, nowadays, I I might buy a book, I might buy an Audible. I might I might buy the entire version of it, but I don't necessarily go through every page. Um, I look at highlights of of things that I feel are relevant to me and what I'm doing, and I might revisit the same book <laughs> uh, unless it's yeah. such an interesting piece that I need to look at, you know, page to page, cover to cover, um, or the entire cycle of that audio book. I, I don't. I mean, like I, I only look at portions of it and I grasp information that I need to and and process it and immediately try and bring out what what's what's relevant in practical terms. So I, yeah, of course you're right. There are different schools of thought on it, but uh, it all just depends on the on the book, the you know the, whether it's written or audio type of information. I, yeah, I act actually might disagree on that slightly okay um, go on i think respectfully of course um i think it tends to come down to your individual learning style how you absorb information um 
best. I'm not someone who uh, tends to learn very efficiently by reading or mm -hmm. just uh, almost a one dimensional learning uh, uh, medium, right? Just reading it. It's a very inefficient way for me to retain information and then actually think how to, you know, apply it on a subconscious level, a reactionary level, which is, I think, most important. Um, but the best way for me to uh, absorb information by reading is if I'm interested in it. Uh, actually, one of the things with uh, autism is that you tend to only be interested in very specific areas of focus. Yeah. Um, ironically, I read very little about uh, aviation. Mm -hmm. um, the chief operating officer for a, uh, a media outlet for mm -hmm. aviation, actually one of the largest media outlets in the entire world, which is crazy to say, but I barely read at all. Um, the thing that I think I read more about is actually Polynesian islands and islands in the South Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why I just really like it, but <laughs> a lot of the material on that cannot be found um, mm -hmm. in audio versions. Typically, they're, uh, you know, research papers um, or just articles that people just never read that were published and put online in the late 90s, you know, barely locatable on the Internet. Um, but you know, I just, I don't know why, I just really like islands. Like the more remote the island is, um, and obscure it is, I guess, the more interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, there's over 10,000 islands in Polynesia. So, I'm, you know, it's going to take a while. It's going to definitely take a while. Yeah. Uh, but that's, I guess, a good pursuit. I could read about that all day. Yeah. Um, but with audio versions of a book, um, I noticed that it's it's a great uh, strategy to learn when I'm doing something um, already kinesthetically and then mm -hmm. uh, listening to an audio book uh, at the same time or a podcast about it. it tends to be that discussion um, of a uh, particular subject, um, anything to get the endorphins. Uh, slightly higher uh, than it would be when reading, which for me, it just wouldn't be very, I'm not very entertained by uh, reading about things that I don't like, but a good discussion, uh, in-depth discussion on a particular topic, um, I think is, is the best way to go for me because it tends to be a little bit more fun. And when something's fun and more interesting, I retain uh, more of it and able to apply more now. But that being said, when it's a highly technical subject that I'm listening to, uh, whether it be on a podcast or audio book, it's mm -hmm. important that I take note of, um, you know, some more sophisticated vocabulary um, discussed mm -hmm. within it and then topics and concepts to research uh, on my own independently because there's stuff that I won't understand. And naturally, when you learn something new, there's, you know, it's going to be full yeah. of different things that you just don't know. Yeah. Um, so that's something that when I have to, yes, I will, you know, read. Uh, about how something works um, because and then in that case you know all I need to read about that is um, you know less than mm -hmm. a chapter to understand a very simple subject that I just didn't know what it was before um, you know reading but I heard it in a podcast but I didn't know so I have to read about that and in that case reading is far more efficient than um, a podcast or or an audiobook because with that, you don't really have the option to uh, fast forward through a program you don't know mm -hmm. in which the information is located. Um, so reading a page or two, a research paper, um, even um, yeah. several pages, is far more efficient than uh, listening for that very specific uh, piece of information. And then in that case, you're also on some bit of a mission. So there's the excitement of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's the thrill of hunting down a concept and you know devouring it but yeah. information in terms of literature tends to be uh like that and the best that i can do is uh do it while i'm doing some listen to it while i'm doing something yeah fun yeah yeah, yeah. so so jeremy tell us what what is the day in the life of uh jeremy look like these days with all the things that you have um, <laughs> working on <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually I wake up um, 
Well, I hope I wake up. Um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about it. I was like, yeah, I think everyone tends to wake up if they're alive. So that's good for starters. Um, no, I wake up around 6 a.m. Um, and then I tend to, I have a really bad, ha I have several, several bad habits, but I usually go on my phone immediately and I definitely have to stop doing that. But, um, I go on my phone and I, I just check messages, emails and Instagram, um, things that I definitely shouldn't do, but I just kind of do it anyways. Um, <laughs> And then uh, do that for maybe about 10, 15 minutes. And I get up, you know, I get dressed, just do all the normal people stuff. Um, and usually go downstairs. I don't eat more than once a day. So mm -hmm. I skip breakfast and I skip lunch uh, on most days. Um, I usually go downstairs, kind of figure out what I'm going to do. I have a, uh, a white uh, board, a dry erase marker mm -hmm. board um, in my living room that I hung up. I want to get more of them because I really like them. Um, but I typically plot out um, what I'm going to do on an agenda um, because I don't like having a, a schedule. Schedules are disappointing um, because you, you're you never going to achieve what you want to do mm. on a schedule. It's just setting you up for failure. It's like ordering tacos at Chipotle. It's just setting yourself up for disappointment. Chipotle is a, a, a restaurant. Mm -hmm. by the way in uh in america just yeah. for anyone who's unfamiliar <laughs> yeah and uh the tacos are the worst thing you can get there because they always <laughs> you know, get wet and fall apart <laughs> yeah tell me tell me about it i know i know the experience but go on <laughs> yeah. just setting yourself up for disappointment um but yeah i usually uh write out an agenda and then uh, triage what is most important mm -hmm. um and difficult do that first um and then the the other stuff um is just kind of what i can get to uh in the day and uh from then on i usually uh get in my car drive over to starbucks um get coffee there uh get some emails out of the way because i tend to concentrate better when there's people running around making noise or whatever mm -hmm. um that tends to be a lot of uh a great motivator for concentration. It's almost, I've never taken Adderall, but I, I'd imagine it's something like that. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, an environmentally induced uh, hyper focus. But some people take Adderall, I guess I just take in public uh, environmental factors <laughs> <laughs> in chaos. Um, and then from then on, I usually just go uh, onto a task, to a different task, and then, uh, you know, and so on from there. The morning time is usually filled with uh, phone calls for about an hour and a half uh, for the aircraft brokerage. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, uh, after that, I'm typically working on uh, Travel Radar, which is the media company. Um, and then I'm usually on Microsoft Teams, you know, hosting meetings, uh, delegating different uh, sort of tasks and objectives uh, that I have um, to do. Um, so the morning time is really good for delegating. Um, I've noticed uh, responsibility and doing it uh, appropriately. So um, around lunchtime, our time because uh, Travel Radar is headquartered in London, actually, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. coincidentally. Uh, so the time difference is about, you know, five hours ahead this time of year. Uh, so around lunchtime, I tend to uh, praise a lot of my employees there um, just at random. Doing it at random is a lot more uh sincere than you know after performing a task or anything associated to the timeline of you know asking to do a task like no one no one likes that there's nothing more insincere than receiving an email and you know it starts off with i hope you're having a good day so far mm -hmm. like everyone knows that's bullshit you don't mm -hmm. really wish that but on a random saturday emailing that with you know like a question mark and nothing else that's then they care you know um, and I really do care and I want to make sure that they know that without any sort of um, confusion. But when it's time to actually hunker down and get something accomplished, that's that's the mission. That's you know what we're only going to be focusing on um, mm -hmm. for the time being. 
but it's still very important that you follow up um, with your with your people, whether it be employees, peers, uh, supervisors, etc. Um, that sort of sincerity is is really important from my uh, perspective and experience. But around lunchtime, it's usually uh, just following up with the uh, overseas folks mm -hmm. um, and doing that and then kind of scheming out what I need to do for the next day and the week, um, month and so on. Um, after that, usually run a few errands um, and then work on lesson plans for teaching. Mm -hmm. um, about three days of the week, I'm volunteering. So I do that in the afternoon a little bit um, for a few hours around 5 p.m. I start thinking about dinner, but then I usually don't eat until like 10 p.m. Uh, mm -hmm. Just with everything there is to do. Um, I go home. I either study a new language for about an hour and a half or uh, mm -hmm. work on some uh, Polynesian island uh, mm -hmm. stuff, learning about that. Um, usually clean up a little bit. I like cleaning around my house, which is weird, I guess. <laughs> um, and then work on work, uh, get started with other work tasks. Um, but at that point, it's just frivolous and fun. Um, and then I usually FaceTime uh, my best friend and, uh, you know, text my other friends. A lot of my other friends don't like FaceTime, which is disappointing. Um, but then I usually, you know, try and find something um, that makes me laugh, I guess. There's not a whole lot of structure to my day. I guess that's what I'm uh, going to yeah. get at. Yeah. But everything seems to uh, to get done um, pretty efficiently. And I think it's uh, due to the overall flexibility. Mm -hmm. And, and um, is, is most of what you do remote-based or do you have to Almost go to... entirely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a, There's a lot of benefits to it, isn't it? Numbers. It is, but, you know, just like the emails, it can be quite insincere at times. Mm. Um, but I couldn't get enough. As much as I get done uh, remote, I could not get as much done uh, in an office space. Mm. Um and then, you know, in the office space, there's also a lot of uh, liabilities in terms of, you know, like regulations. Mm -hmm. um, I think things that I tend to want to avoid um, in the workplace, if I were to have my own office space, um, whether it be as a, uh, a leader or a, uh, a subordinate, right, for lack of better words, um, I think one of the worst things you can do is uh, have a dress code. Mm -hmm. um, having a, a workplace in which you have people who require to dress a, a certain way um, or in a way they wouldn't otherwise uh, would tend to lower the productivity. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's done, you know, out of a concern for uh, status or uh, distraction, um, but having to tuck your shirt in every mm -hmm. now and then breaks away from you know your overall concentration and it's not something you would do naturally so there tends to be a liability factor that i'm not always sure is realized by all employers um is that it's a liability then you know tucking standing up to from your chair to tuck your shirt and just as an example mm -hmm. that doesn't cost you know the 10 seconds or so that it takes it costs the amount of time it takes to recuperate your concentration and mm -hmm. momentum True. on your task and you obviously stood up because it was bothering you anyways mm. um so that in itself is a huge liability and then putting people on a time table a time schedule right yeah. that they wouldn't normally uh hold themselves to is a very unnatural um way to live i mm. guess mm. um so i think the the top concern of being in a workplace is you're you're asking people who you're you're purchasing labor from them. Mm. It's a two way transaction. I wish more people kind of realize this is that when you're an employee, you're selling mm. your labor in exchange for finances from your, you know, your company, your customer in that case, your yeah. client. Yeah. And then, you know, vice versa. You're, you know, your your workplace is, you know, purchasing labor and they're providing you with 
finances and, you know, they're purchasing a product from you, which is labor and, you know, whatever your focus tends to be results. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think there's some pretty messed up fundamentals um, in terms of physical workspaces. But uh, I think if we were to combine the flexibility mm -hmm. um, and lesser pressure workplaces, such as uh, remote work, um, mm -hmm. but bringing that into an optional um, or yeah. partially mandatory uh, in-person workspace, I think that would be, I think that would be a great um, solution to people who don't necessarily enjoy working from home or remotely. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. But... Complete, complete, complete sense. I'm very much aligned with, uh, with that aspect as well. I'm, I generally challenge, I work with a number of clients myself and I know, you know, pre pandemic, there was this drive towards making sure that employees came to the office and then suddenly things just shifted were forced to move to remote working for example but now we need to be thinking about um new ways of working um and the behaviors the relationship based and it's it's not just about hybrid working. I mean, there's much more to hybrid working and uh, the future of work has changed mentally, physically, how you operate as an organization. It's There's so many dimensions towards it. So, uh, yeah, I'm for, fully aligned with that. I, it's, it's, it's just trying to get some of these executives on board with these concepts and for them to get comfortable with it because they are still operating with uh, uh you know with that notion that you need to have physical contact pretty much every day and uh you know i'm of the view well it's more relationship based you know so um sure but that there's much yeah. more deeper 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 aspects to that as well it's not just a, a flippant comment of well it's just relationship based yeah. right it's a it's a several faceted um yeah relationship between you know results and then the actual day-to-day -day execution of tasks leading to result um i think it's a uh, two extremes um, right now, you know, 2019, uh, you know, leading up to 2020, like you were saying, there was a huge uh, emphasis or a very popular, right, emphasis on in-person mm -hmm. uh, working has to be in-person. There has to be a daily face-to-face -face interaction and consistently. Almost all interactions in the workplace have to be in-person, which in the defense of people who believe that or believed it at the time right it does make sense i can totally empathize with that fact it just it just makes sense it's the way it's always done and it's worked pretty well um it really has worked pretty well for results but i don't think it's always worked pretty well um or well at all for most uh people that you know who work there at all um and what's ironic is i think that from my observations is that a lot of leaders, the more they get into their position, whether it be status uh, rank within the company, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, I think a bullshit concept anyways, you know, there shouldn't be any sort of uh, excessive uh, pride or, um, uh, I don't know how you would call it. Um, there shouldn't be any excessive buy-in uh, to mm -hmm. your position in a company um, as a leader because, you know, you're obviously there to serve your employees, um, mm -hmm. not to absorb or consume the uh, the position itself or take advantage of it. I think that's one mm -hmm. thing that um, sometimes uh, C-suite level of leaders tend to lose sight of or see yeah. past see slightly over it um mm -hmm. and i think that's a that's a mistake an honest mistake obviously you know some things that tend to have a terrible 
uh, result often mm-hmm. aren't done intentionally. It's a series yeah. of small compromises here and there yeah. um, that lead to just a not so desirable uh, result. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously some, uh, you know, it's obviously implied and it's a coincidental or uh, it's a side effect of that is, a, you know, a total uh, decline of empathy. Um, but, you know, going from that, it's, I think we're at two extremes. Like I was saying is that in 20, you know, until 2020, we were very, uh, centric on at least here in the West, right. We were very centric on showing up to work every day. Um, and then post 2020, um, and throughout the pandemic, we're almost entirely centric on remote work. Yeah. So now we're at, you know, one extreme to another. And, you know, I think over the next five years, we're going to find some sort of balance between the two and also depend upon uh, the business itself, um, your, you know, focus. Obviously, pilots, they kind of need to show up to work. There's yeah. there's not a substitute for, you <laughs> know, working remotely. Yeah. Um but, you know, there's other people too, um, you know, like financial advisors, they can work 100%, you know, from home, except for, you know, in-person stuff, which I think obviously should be mandatory for some meetings, um, understanding who your colleagues are, yeah. um, you know, I think for, for people, for interaction with people face-to-face, yeah. face, there's nothing better than that. Um, you know, Zoom is not as good as in-person. You know, if we could do this podcast in person, yeah. that would be optimal you know Absolutely, but yeah. we have substitutes and they're good they're great things we have these nowadays when we didn't before and i think we also got to be really thankful for that um but i tend to find it slightly demoralizing as well um i don't know how it is in the uk but here in america we tend to have a lot of people who are highly educated in jobs that don't need to exist and that's mm-hmm. definitely going to sound really just unsavory and uh i guess downright disrespectful but something that i see quite often and i think that leads into um a depressive state um mm-hmm. in young professionals is that people realizing that their their position their job their task doesn't really benefit anyone it's a frivolous mm-hmm. um contribution and i don't know how to say that that kindly Mm -hmm. but it's something that i observe um and i sincerely believe is that a lot of jobs here don't need to exist they exist to fill a pay uh, payroll quota um, you know a hiring quota right Mm -hmm. for a company which requires a certain amount of you know employees for government funding um grants etc but i think once well i tend to notice directly that once people understand that whatever they're working whatever they're doing doesn't benefit it doesn't they're not gonna when they finish up their their job it it hasn't really made the world uh, any much better place yeah Um, so i think that leads to a lot of dissatisfaction um and and people the employee and obviously it leads to somewhat of a demoralizing uh, underlying approach to work and then remote work I think is uh, sought after uh, because it's it eases uh, it eases the, the pain of having to be at work anyways yeah um, and you know just being at work doing a job that you just kind of know doesn't really benefit anyone um, is that would be that would be worse than working from home and getting paid for something that you just yeah yeah so so jeremy we're coming to a close now um really appreciate you for uh for being on the on the show is there any final closing message in the next few seconds that you want to just raise aside from the things that you've just been describing oh no i'm good thank you there's nothing yeah okay 25 yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I enjoyed having this uh, this conversation with you. It was really, really enlightening to hear your your journey, Jeremy. And uh, for you, for 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 being with us, to, uh, being with us today, 
and um, and also sharing your perspectives as well. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate it. We should, uh, you know, connect some other time as well, just to have a conversation because I spoke a lot here, but I barely learned anything uh, about you, barely asked any questions. Yeah. So I definitely, yeah. you know, would love to connect with you again. And, yeah, you know, we'll do that. Learn. Yeah, uh -huh. no, we'll do that. Okay, folks, um, thank you very much for listening in and stay tuned for our next episode where we hear the hidden remit and the life and leadership of a chief of staff of a high growth firm. Stay tuned for our next episode on this and continue to stay on to hear about an exclusive offer for you. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoy the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You're now seeing this part of the video also because you consume some of my content, insights and teachings. Maybe you've been to my LinkedIn page or website or seen other social media ads or listened to my podcast. I'm Stephen Paul, a business and transformational executive coach, strategic advisor, leader and board member. I've been in diverse roles, corporate executive, entrepreneur and worked with businesses and firms of all sizes, built and launched businesses created high impact boards and so forth in four continents. I get it. I've been there, done that. But what is different is I bring a unique perspective and a playbook. I've helped 100 plus business leaders just like you to scale and align their leadership top teams, the board and overall business for growth. Leaders like Ivana from medium sized company in the EU who grew 150% and expanded globally in under five months. After she started to work with me over facilitated session sessions in an initial three days, I helped fine tune their strategy and align their leadership team and board to be a cohesive driving force to achieve their dreams and outcomes. I want to teach you the same thing and more on how to scale and align your leadership team and board so you can increase your business growth and value. Get clarity on what is the next right strategy for you. There are multiple ways we can work with you. Number one, click the link for a free non-obligatory 60-minute initial strategic session. Let's get a feel for your dreams, your vision, your challenges, and let me convert that into a route map for you where we can co-develop and co-pilot. Number two, enroll in an innovative and intuitive digital online course that I have curated, created to help you transform. It's called Unshakable Resilience. It is the ultimate program for individuals and business leaders like you who want to be equipped at a personal and professional level to respond to any form of challenges or in crisis situations and take on opportunities with grit, resilience, and build a mindset of success. In essence, you want to be unshakable, thrive in crisis, take on opportunities in the face of adversity, and build a success mindset. So click the link below to learn more on how I can personally help you individually and your firm to scale and align your leadership team and business and pivot in a transformational way. And for you to experience this, whatever the challenge you're facing, get in touch with me. Let's discuss and I will share my insight rapidly to enable your transformation. Click the links below.